This week's edition of NJBIA's Minding Your Business is brought to you in part by AT&T, helping family, friends, and neighbors connect in meaningful ways every day. PPAC Gladstone Bank, known nationally and in New Jersey for providing unparalleled client service, integrity, and trust for over 100 years. New Jersey's community colleges, aligning education to build an innovative workforce. Find out how your business can benefit at njpathways.org and by New Jersey Business Magazine, providing critical information needs for New Jersey's business community for more than 66 years. Welcome to NJBI's Money Your Business, I'm Bob Considine. Well, when it comes to cleanliness, many New Jersey businesses are unfortunately not next to godliness due to a lack of available time and staff. But attention to detailed janitorial services is a professional cleaning service that has been providing a unique approach to their work since 2012. And here to talk about how their clean teams make a real difference for commercial clients throughout the state is the owner and founder of ATD, Denise Considine Christopher. Denise, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And we should tell the folks right up front that Denise has the misfortune, serious misfortune of being my sister. So um, I'm very glad you're here though. And, and for, for all the friends and family who we have not told mm -hmm. that you were gonna be here, do not adjust your set. Yeah, yes. But I, I, I do, in all seriousness, I am so glad you're here because we often talk about small businesses here, how they start, how they grow, and your story is as good as anyone. So tell the folks how you got started with ATD um, cleaning, uh, janitorial service. Um, in 2012, I was recently divorced. Mm -hmm. I was living in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. I remember. Uh, you came to visit me once. <laughs> um, and um, had to move back to New Jersey with my two daughters at the time. And I uh, had to move in with mom. Yeah. Recently divorced, I yeah. had to figure it out, make it on my own. Yep. And um, that's where it all started. I asked our sister Lori yeah. if she would let me clean her house. Needed money fast. Yeah. Um, wow. And uh, I had a borrowed car. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, okay, I can't put gas in this car. And tough uh, stuff. yeah, really and tough. so that's where it started. Right. Did Lori pay you? Or? Yeah, she did pay she me. She didn't. All right, that's good. So that was and, the start. And was her house really messy? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. But yeah. I was so grateful because that was. Uh, that was the start, yeah. you know? Um, at the time I had a social media marketing and graphic design business, mm -hmm. which when you look back makes sense, it all kind of helps in the business that I'm in now. Yeah. So. And you always had a kind of an entrepreneurial sense before that. Yeah. So what made you kind of take the leap of faith uh, to, to actually start the business? I had to put food on the table, I had to pay bills mm -hmm. and I needed the money. Right. So um, would, I started there and then contacted our old friend, Lou Mucardo. Right. Uh, he had a small cleaning business and I had asked if I could work with him. Right. Um, so I had a couple jobs from him and I would start early in the morning, three, four in the morning, start with restaurants um, and work sometimes 14 hour days. Yeah. And thankfully mom was there to yeah. help take care of Abby and Kaylee. Yeah, we love mom. And uh, I just had to figure it out. Right. Yeah. How about in terms of growing the business and kind of what challenges you face? You know, you're 12 years in, you've mm -hmm. seen this great growth over this. Uh, what kind of challenges have you run into? Was COVID a, a challenge for you? Challenges, starting back, I was uh, starting really with some residential and then some commercial. Right. But then realizing, okay, I need my own general liability, workman's comp insurance. Mm -hmm. um, the expense of that kind of pushed me out of the residential market and mm -hmm. I had to go with commercial. Um, so for the first few years, well, first year and a half, I was doing the residential, went over to commercial, mm -hmm. uh, then COVID comes in. Right. Right. So COVID actually helped our business. Oh, yeah. You know, sure. people were very, it, it was great for us. Um, we could answer a lot of questions. People were now, yeah. they had an interest in cleaning their offices. Right. Um, before, you know, maybe it was a little more lax, but right. now it was a priority. You know, I don't remember you actually cleaned this building during COVID. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what year it was, maybe 2019 uh, or something. Yeah, it was kind of in the beginning. Do you know we've tried to get this building dirty since you left <laughs> and we just can't do it. That's how good <laughs> That's ATD janitorial services. Thank you, yeah. thank you. And you've always been, you know, just going back to when we were growing up, they say kids are like sponges. Denise actually had a sponge. 
And she used several. it all the time. She had several sponges, and that's, that's what she used. <laughs> Um, let's talk about some of the services that ATD provides. There's a long list. What do there you is. Uh, we have the electrostatics, uh, which actually we really just got into through COVID. Electrostatic. Uh, dis- the uh, electrostatic disinfecting. Okay. What uh, is that? It is when a positive and a negative uh, meet. You have the liquid, which I think was the positive, and then meeting the negative, <laughs> whatever it was. The right. liquid wraps itself around every surface right. through our electrostatic guns. There's spe- special equipment that we have. Oh, my God. Uh, it has the disinfectant in it, and then it um, just wraps itself around those two positive negatives, and then it wraps itself around every surface, so there's no germs. So you can do it on a floor and the walls? Everywhere, yeah. um, and it Ceiling. doesn't hurt. Yeah, it dries quick. Right. Ceiling if you want. Um, <laughs> but it's really more high contact areas, mm-hmm. um, and it's not just for COVID. It's for flu viruses right. as well. So that's something we come in and uh, if people have an outbreak of flu or COVID virus, then they could um, mm-hmm. request that service. What else? Uh, general office maintenance cleaning. Mm-hmm. Um, we found through our experience that um, every business owner's need is different. They mm-hmm. have bigger concerns uh, than others. Some don't really care. Some do care. Um, people want their moldings extra clean. People want their floors extra clean. Right. High touch surfaces. It just depends. Every person is different and we address their needs individually. Mm-hmm. We also work with hoarder cleanouts, yeah. which has become a big part of our business. Right. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting. Everybody has their own story, and you really see what happens. So when we talk about hoarder, these are not businesses per se. These are what estates. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, they're estates. Okay. Uh, we work for several attorneys mm-hmm. as well. They'll call us in. Oh, that's uh, neat. Yeah. <laughs> so they'll call us in and say either um, you know we have a hoarder situation, or if somebody passed away, they didn't realize a situation was going on, right, and right. they'll call us in. So we'll go in, and we kind of meticulously go through, sort, pack, and we do a lot of donating mm-hmm. of the items. So um, it's it's interesting. Do you ever have interaction in those cases, interaction with the families uh, yes. to say, you know, we're going to take care of this stuff. We're not just going to toss it. Yes, we do. And with that, there's a big trust mm-hmm. because there's times we find, we'll find military papers, uh, religious items. Right. Uh, we find we found this gorgeous heirloom engagement ring that this family didn't even know existed. Right. And they were so happy to get it back. Mm-hmm. The other side, in terms, get goosebumps now. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of value, we know that there's things that we might view as personal, or I know that somebody may want this. Mm -hmm. We did a clean out um, on the back of a pantry door was the Nana's apron that she cooked in every day. Oh, wow. And the family was so happy to have it. So we just meticulously go through Mm -hmm. and uh, find these things. What other kind of cool things you've dug up? We found um, (laughs) uh, an original newspaper article. I think it was the New York Times Mm -hmm. uh, from when Abraham Lincoln was shot. Really? So right. what we did with that is we framed it, beautiful frame, and we uh, donated it to a um, uh, to a gala or a, mm-hmm. a uh, charity. And yeah, so, I want to get into your charity yeah. work in a bit. Um, and just going back to the, uh, the the business side, when these businesses come to you, what are they trying to do? Are they just are they like if if it's a building owner, are they? moving tenants or are they closing the building? Who's coming at you? Uh, mostly people who are looking to maintain their buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, we do post construction okay. as well, but to maintain their buildings, you know, they don't need their, they need their employees focusing on their jobs, not right. cleaning. Uh, that's, that's not their job. You right. know, uh, the garbage removal, the uh, disinfecting of surfaces. Right. Sometimes people have us in three days a week. Sometimes it's every other week. It just right. depends what they need and how busy their office or their hair salon. Just depends what the business is. Uh, have you ever walked into a, a building where you're like, oh my goodness, how are we ever going to clean this? Like, it's just so... Yes, and it's a challenge. Yeah. And we like the challenge. And I love the before and after and making a difference. That's right. really what it is. Uh, we've heard multiple times that Oh my goodness, you picked up your phone. You know, that's... <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit. I mean, when you get a call, I mean, uh, I guess it seems like you have a conversation with these folks before. It's not just, here's your price. And right, call, no, call it's a conversation and it's, uh, I want to get to know you. I want to get to know your needs. I want to yeah. show that we care. And if we mess up, we're going to come fix it because right. that can happen. No, no it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so uh, Laszlo and I will we'll yeah. get to Laz in a minute, yeah. but um, Laz and I will go out and we'll assess the job. Mm-hmm. And we'll provide them with a proposal, showing our insurance certificates, references, and everything on there. So you have have to have certification for this, I guess. Yeah, I mean the yeah. certification just as, as far as insurances and mm-hmm. business registrations and Got stuff. It. Yeah. 
Uh, talk about Laszlo a little bit. Okay. So uh, 2012, when um, I started the business, um, I soon after that met Laszlo. Mm-hmm. And, um, Laszlo Soltes. Laszlo Soltes. And he uh, we became partners in business and in life. Mm-hmm. And in crime. Uh, and in crime. <laughs> Just once in a while. So, uh, yeah. So we um, also handled baby girl yeah. together. So now we have three girls. Right. Uh, so we're busy. And uh, with that, during all of this, we also got our real estate license. Oh, my goodness. So, right. um, so sometimes in a hoarder clean out or a general estate clean out, we will clean out the home, clean the home, and then list the home. So it's like one business feeds into the other right. a little bit. Well, and that just kind of happened. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, on purpose. It just happened. Yeah. With that, now the social media marketing and the graphic design comes in. Yeah. And, you know, you you were never deterred, even not having a young child, Brooke, who we love, mm-hmm. uh, the cutest kid ever. Um, you know, you're really undeterred. It was like, I remember you, um, you worked on the Monday before you had Brooke. You had Brooke on a Wednesday and you were helping... Abby move into college on yes. a Saturday. Yes. What's He's, wrong with you? Yeah, just got to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> got things to do. Yeah, but why? I mean, what is your mindset with all of this? To just keep going. Mm-hmm. You just got to keep going. Mm-hmm. And I get to the point where when things like that are happen, I, happen, I go, what else you got for me? Like, mm-hmm. I just, it's a challenge, mm-hmm. you know, and you just keep going. It's, yeah. uh, you have to. It's that mindset of uh, sink or swim. Mm-hmm. Help yourself or you don't. Yeah. You know? I can tell the folks that Denise does not like to hear people complain. No. It, no. Know, it's very annoying. Right. <laughs> uh, it's uh, nobody really cares. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just you have to. Everyone's gone through their own situation in life. Yeah. Um, and are you going to let that define you or are you going to pick up and keep going? Right. Yeah. So along that line, uh, charitable services mm. you work with, name them. And why are you doing this? Okay, so once we kind of got established and we were doing well, um, because it took a little while, you know, to kind of find our niche and what was happening, I wanted to give back a little, and Laz and I were discussing it, and we just, uh, one of our cousins, close cousins, had lost their son uh, at 18 months old, uh, Joey. So they had a a tremendous organization, it's uh, Joey's Little Angels, Mm -hmm. and they just run charity, I mean, uh, events, I would say, I don't know, two, three, four times a year. Right. One larger than the other. They just had a big toy drive. Made, yeah. They they reached 50,000 toys so yeah. far since they've been going. Mm-hmm. We wanted to give back. So um, we just kind of, you know, we don't help in big ways. We just help as we can and right. just kind of make that our focus. We wear their logo on our shirt and just it gives an, op- an opportunity to talk about it. visibility. To yeah. Yep. Uh, and just even to, to for our employees, you mm-hmm. know, look, let's talk about Joey. Let's, yeah. you know. Um, and also uh, we had Brooke do a little lemonade stand. <laughs> so it's just whatever we could do right. to bring awareness right. to it. I, I can't even imagine what you charged. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> $5 a cup. Well, I mean, <laughs> I just think what you've been, uh, what you've done, Denise, has been fantastic. Uh, you know, some of our members are using your services yes. and they, they love it. So to the businesses, large and small out there, uh, if you wanted to get an estimate or find out more about attention to detail janitorial services, you're going to go to atdcleanteam.com. These folks, they clean and they care and they do a great job. And Denise, I am incredibly proud of you. Thank you. And thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I'll be back right after these words. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again Because a vision softly dreaming Left it seems my heart was sleeping Welcome back to NJBI is Mind Your Business. I'm Bob Considine. Well, we may not know how artificial intelligence works, but the folks at Prager Metis know that it can work for you and your business. In a recent chat with Prager Metis CEO Glenn Friedman and Chief Information Officer Joe Rust, both executives said AI is something that should be embraced by businesses in a world of emerging technology. Take a look. All right, Glenn and Joe, thank you so much for being here. Before we get into artificial intelligence. Let's talk a little bit about Prager Metis. I'll, I'll let you take this, Glenn. What do you guys provide for your clients? Well, we're a global advisor and accounting firm. We, we, we 
provide a whole host of advisory services as well as traditional accounting services, uh, everything from international assistance to um, small business, privately held companies, public companies, various industries. Uh, Joe's out in LA and we, we have a fairly large uh, entertainment practice, but clearly we're here to talk about artificial intelligence and that's an industry that's uh, quite in the thick of it these days. Right, so let's let's go right to it. AI, how is it finding its way into the business world, both of you? I, I can start with that one. And I think what we're gonna find is that AI is becoming more and more embedded in the software and tools that we use every day. You know, right. Microsoft currently has Copilot, which is embedded in their Microsoft Office 365. And so I think we're, it's gonna just become more and more commonplace to have some sort of integrated AI built into the software solutions we use every day. I would agree with that. I, I think that from sort of the management standpoint, uh, whether you think your staff and your team are, are using AI or not, they probably are. And therefore, uh, you know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. And right. you really need to uh, embrace the technology uh, and then put proper controls and, and factors into place so that uh, people understand the rules of the road, that it can be used, when it should be used, how it should be used. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, you could wind up in a, in a bad place. Yeah, we're going to get to all that. But, you know, when we talk about AI, and I, I, I told you guys I'm not an expert on this at all. But, you know, I think some people naturally gravitate to, oh, my goodness, uh, AI is going to steal my job. I'm going to be worthless. AI is going to take my spouse out to dinner and leave me. Um, how do you quell those fears for people? I, th I think you have to think of AI as a, a human assisted tool. It assists you in help them perform their capabilities, enhance the way that they can approach client services. Uh, it makes you more efficient, uh, accurate. It takes a lot of the mind numbing, soul crushing uh, tasks and, and handles those uh, and, and really leaves the human to do more, more human work. Look, I, every technology or every advance um, leaves somebody behind, right? But I personally believe that it, it creates greater uh, opportunity for most and an expansion in the economy. It, I mean, if you go back to, you know, the Model T or you look at uh, orchestras that are no longer employed because there's technologies to replace them, I, I think that most industries have expanded. If you look at the amount of downloads in the music industry, yeah. you can't say that the music industry was harmed by technology. And believe me, everybody was afraid of all of those those streaming devices and the record industries were, were afraid of it. And, you know, the horse and buggy are, are certainly gone. And I don't think that our economy uh, retracted. If anything, it grew and there were more opportunities for people. Will somebody lose a, a position? I, I think so. But I, I honestly, I've been thinking about this. And I think in today's environment, um, the, the jobs that will probably be lost first are jobs that have already been lost. They've been outsourced to to other countries, frankly, if we're all being honest about this, you know, whether it's the uh, customer service provider or or a bookkeeping service. So I, I do think that there, uh, you know, are, are jobs that will be lost. Most will not be, I don't believe in, in this country at first, um, but I, I think you need to be prepared and you need to retrain. Um, I want to read you guys some statistics that I pulled regarding uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, kind of where it's been and where it's going. Uh, according to Forbes, 97% of business owners believe that ChatGPT will positively, positively affect their business operations. Uh, according to Grandview Research, uh, the, AI, the AI market is already worth $136.5 billion, and the report also predicts a compound annual growth rate of 37.3% from now till 2030. And just one more uh, data point, guys. Uh, Allied Market Research says 91% of leading organizations are investing in AI activities and investments in AI in the social media market alone is expected to reach $12 billion uh, by 2031. So given all this, I got to ask both you guys, where do you see AI going? And, you know, if is it possible for a business to not be a part of AI and actually compete? 
Well, I could start with that in terms of our industry. Glenn mentioned a moment ago how involved we are in the entertainment industry and music in particular. Right. Where I think it'd be almost impossible to do my job without AI. You know, back in the day, if you sold a million vinyl records, uh, you had a platinum album on your hands. Today, right. just have a million streams, you, you might be able to buy a nice bottle of wine. So what that's, what we find today is that we have billions and billions of streams by Spotify, Apple, Google, Napster. And can you imagine trying to trace billions of streams from a sales report to a royalty statement? I mean, our son's going to go supernova in five billion years. I don't know how many of these jobs I'd be able to finish without using AI. Look, I think that people don't even realize it, but it's here already, right? Mm -hmm. In your everyday life, um, you might not see what's behind um, some of the technology that is being used for you, around you, with you, um, but it's being used, uh, whether it's a billion streams or, um, you know, just accumulating data. Uh, look at investments. I think investment complexity will grow. Uh, as has happened with the computer. I, I think that we'll see investments that, and the speed and velocity of investments that could be made that could never have been made if somebody was sitting there just trying to manually um, figure out a formula to make, make such an investment. So I, I think it has a positive in, impact on, on us. And again, I do believe, you know, I actually put out a mandate, if you will, if there's ever mm -hmm. such a thing anymore, <laughs> that, that our departments start to explore the use of AI in their department. I was shocked, and I shouldn't be, at how many of our departments were already employing some form of artificial intelligence. I, I was shocked. But recently, I attended an industry trade show, and every vendor there was was in some way talking about the artificial intelligence that they had embedded in their product. So I, I think that, you know, you're talking about an industry now, it's just going to grow, will get smarter. I mean, those things are above my pay grade. I, I, my assumption is artificial intelligence will get smarter. It's machine learning. Um, and, and we'll all be better off for it. Mm -hmm. uh Joe, I know you've written about this. I wanted to ask you about this kind of out of left field. Is there any risk of, uh, you know, losing the importance of human capital through all this as AI progresses? Yeah, I, I mean, certainly in the music industry, I think it's important to uh, recognize the human contribution to any kind of creation. We have situations now where you have collaborations between, you know, uh, artists that have never met each other. And, and That's right. it's a generative uh, music, uh, AI creating generative music that was not properly copyrighted, that was trained on uh, models that didn't didn't consider, you know, copyright and, and, and the proper use of it. And so I, I think what you see is um, there's, there's a technology that is advancing, but it has to be used ethically. So I have no problem if you want to train a, a model on properly licensed content. And if, if the content creators are on board with that, great. You know, the, right. the, you, know you, you had uh, you know, the Beatles announced where they took some of their old masters and used AI just to clean it up a bit. It wasn't used to create new content, but really just to uh, help enhance uh, some of those old masters that they had. And that, that's a perfect use you know, of AI as a tool. Well, you know, it, that to me, Joe, is amazing because what that did was basically took a John Lennon vocal from a piano and separated it in order for them to complete the song, which was amazing. And I, what a gift that was. But there you're almost getting the human capacity from the machine because you would have never had a, a Beatles single ever again, right, if we didn't have that technology. No, I think that's right. Yeah, it, it, again, it's, it's assisting humans in their creative endeavors. Right. Uh, let's talk about Prager Metis again. Using AI, you're using AI internally, how so? Well, <clears throat> in auditing, in data capture and, and analytics, mm -hmm. uh, just in, you know, as an example, but also on, on tax planning, um, in tax research, so I, there's a, almost every area of our firm is now exploring and looking at tools that make the job more efficient. Or, um, I, you know, I don't want to say it speeds the job up because you still need, look, you talk about human element. You can't just take something because it comes out of a machine and accept it. Right. In the old days, we used to do research out of um, big books, right? And we used to employ somebody that would update the books. 
And if those books weren't updated, <laughs> you're getting bad information. You, you know, so you talk about machine language and, and learning, and you, you don't know when that was recently updated. Right. right? So, so you can't just assume that what comes out of a machine is accurate and timely. And frankly, you need a certain level of education and experience to be able to judge what comes out of that machine. So I, look, it's a tool. Will it go beyond a tool? I can't see that far into the future. And anything I say um, won't, won't become a reality. But uh, it's right. a fantastic tool. Uh, we've done things uh, in, in record time that need to be cleaned up. Uh, you need to think about what, what what's on that page, but it's it's powerful. I mean, Joe and I, have, you know, done some pretty amazing things out of artificial intelligence in in seconds. It's great. How about uh, how should businesses be training employees at AI? Yeah, I think you need to have a well. Training is is, is key to it. I think you also have, starts with a, a usage policy. You have to have some broad parameters or guidelines in terms of how your employees and team members are going to be using AI ethically, responsibly. Uh, I think there needs to be an awareness of uh, data security and privacy. That these these models that you're training are, are training on your data, so you do not want to put any private, confidential, sensitive information in there. Right. I think transparency uh, and explainability is important so that whoever the output's going to understands what AI's role in that was, um, that it's not just simply, you know, pushing a button and AI is generating something. And, and it really needs human oversight. You know, there has to be some output or double cross-checking that the content output is is accurate and cross-referenced against, you know, uh, authoritative sources. Yeah, these are great words. Um, great education on this, guys. Um, uh, Prager, Mer Prager Metis is always a firm uh, with people of vision. Uh, they can help their clients with uh, questions and implementation of AI. Uh, for more information and insights, people can go to PragerMetis.com and check out all the services they provide. Glenn Freeman, Joe Rust, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Rob. Thank you, Bob. Have a great day. In closing today, we present you a couple of minutes from NJBIA's recently held public policy forum where Senator Paul Sarlo addressed the state's new electric vehicle mandate banning the sale of new gas cars by 2035. New Jersey's adoption of the Advanced Clean Car 2 rule in November has been vigorously opposed by NJBIA and the general public at large. But Sarlo told New Jersey 101.5 News Director Eric Scott that the mandate will not be feasible. Take a look. Now we can get back to the electric cars. Electric, yeah. the electric cars, <laughs> sorry. That are, sorry. I think it was great. Just before you know, we, we heard from Senator Oroho again, I thought I heard you say, it's not happening by 2035. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. And here's the practical aspect of it. I know everybody in this room fully understands the need to invest in green energy and, and move that in that direction. I don't think anybody here is opposed to that. However, let's be practical about it. 2035 is not happening. Uh, first of all, the automakers and the car makers don't have the ability, the capacity to even build that, in, build that, build that, build those vehicles for us. Um, that's number one, right? And number two is the infrastructure is not here to actually support it. Uh, I see it on, on, on the infrastructure side. You know, they're redoing some different park and rides and they're redoing uh, some strip malls and they're putting in one or two of these because they're costly yet to build uh, the infrastructure. The grid needs to be strengthened to support the electric charging stations. There's a significant amount of federal investment in our infrastructure that needs to go on before we can tell everybody to go out and buy an electric car. Mm -hmm. So... I am sure somebody in the DEP thought this was a great idea to get a great headline, but it's not practical. <laughs> and we know that, and I think you all know that. Of course, our goal is to get there. We all want to work there, but we have a long way to go, and it's great to talk about it, but you need federal dollars to invest in our infrastructure uh, to do this. And at the end of the day, our car makers and our auto dealers, our car makers, our car manufacturers still don't have the capacity to build out all the vehicles that are needed. All right, thank you to those who attended NJBI's public policy forum, and thank you for joining us on NJBI's Minding Your Business. We'll see you next time.